On this TFS Pocket, we make the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. This is TFS Pocket 37. If you're new to this podcast, we're a retro video game podcast that focuses on speedrunning. Speedrunning is a hobby where we try to beat video games as quickly as possible using any tips, tricks, glitches, and strategies wherever possible. And in an upcoming episode, uh, in episode 71, we're actually talking about a few really fantastic Star Wars games. And I thought for my pocket right before that episode, it might be useful to talk about the other Star Wars game for the Famicom that came out right before the ones that we're going to be talking about. Now, the history of Star Wars video games didn't actually start there. Uh, The Star Wars video game franchise actually began in 1983 on the arcade uh, with a title with a game that was originally uh, meant to be titled Warp Speed. And this game uh, was mostly just a shooter, uh, a space shooter um, with that style of combat. And there were actually home console ports uh, for the Amiga, the Atari the ZX Spectrum, and a number of other consoles uh, that people would have had in their homes. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about sort of the history and space of Star Wars video games um, when we get to episode 71 um, on the Star Wars games for the NES. But in December of 1987, the month and year I was born actually, Namco released a Star Wars title based on the first film in the series, A New Hope. Now this was actually released under the company title Namcot, you may have seen that on some games. You may have seen it written as Namco with a T at the end of it. And as far as my research showed, this title actually derived from the start of their home console division. So Namco was a company that specialized in a lot of different things. They were mostly a technology and manufacturing company. And they started a line of home console games and arcade games. And specifically, the home console games were all released under the title Namcot originally. Now, this eventually stopped. You may have seen late NES titles or uh, SNES titles or titles for other consoles with the name Namco. But around this era, around the, the late 80s, you may have been familiar with a few games under the title Namcot. So that's roughly where this came from. Now, this game, Star Wars, uh, just straight titled Star Wars, um, not to be confused with the other Star Wars for the NES, which we'll talk about in our next episode, but this one was released by Namco separately. And in this game, it's it's basically a straight platformer, which it has in common with uh, the other Star Wars title for the NES, but you only play as Luke. So all the other characters are trapped on individual planets. They're not playable, but you're meant to rescue them. And this is commonly regarded as a really difficult game. Uh, It has one hit deaths, three lives only in the entire game, and you only get two continues if you know a password to put in. Otherwise, it's three lives, one continue. As soon as you game over, the game's just done. Uh, The game has difficulty modes, so there's two difficulty modes you can choose from. There's a novice mode and a pro mode, and the only difference between the two difficulty modes are that pro places uh, enemies more frequently throughout the levels. So players who haven't played this game before because of how difficult it actually is to play, most people are are uh, recommended to just play on novice difficulty. Pro can be too frustrating to be enjoyable. I would I would argue, you know, there's there's some games where it's more fun to play on a higher difficulty. It poses more of a challenge, but I think in many ways this game is commonly regarded as a bad game and not in sort of that charming way that we sort of toe the line on in this podcast but in a really frustrating way in a lot of ways and I'll talk a little bit about what makes it so frustrating what makes it such a rough game around the edges but I would argue that this is not one of those games where you would want to play on a harder difficulty in order to give yourself more of a challenge I think that this game is one where you'll be just fine playing on novice and you won't even know the difference the game's already impossible as it is why even bother trying to make it worse one of the things that makes this game so hard is that hitboxes are just impossible Um, when it comes to enemies attacking you you have a massive hitbox. The bullets and enemies don't even have to touch you directly. They just have to come within a certain range of you. And that's enough to damage you. And as I mentioned before, it's one hit kill. So that that's just enough to stop you in your tracks. Whereas alternatively, Luke actually starts the game with the lightsaber. Uh, I'm not going to 
make a ton of commentary about how this game deviates from the source material, but suffice it to say that if you sort of follow along with the narrative I'm going to spin here, this game has almost nothing in common with the original uh, movie or the franchise except for the name. Um, they, they got the character names right, which is the nicest thing I can say. Um, that being said, Luke actually starts the game originally on Tatooine uh, with a lightsaber, and the hitbox on it is just impossible. The tip of it does no damage. You actually have to be fairly close to the enemy. Um, you know, it has the range of a knife despite it having the visual length of a sword. So it can be very frustrating to use, and you actually don't get the ability to uh, shoot like with a blaster until much later in the game, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. So as you kill enemies, they drop a variety of things. Some of them will kill, uh, will drop these power-ups that you can use. Uh, for instance, some power-ups will give you the ability to temporarily use a blaster, which has its own litany of problems with it. Um, but the most common thing for enemies to drop are force gems, which allow you to use uh, these temporary force abilities. By the way, Luke didn't actually uh, get the ability to harness the force until much later in the movie franchise, certainly uh, not well developed in the first movie, um, but like I said, I, I'm going to try my hardest not to dive too deep into how this game deviates from the lore. The different force abilities that you can get, uh, the most useful one is definitely force speed. It costs very little to spend, uh, to buy and allows you to run extremely fast. And with this game in the context of a speed run, um, that, that can play a huge part, not just because you're moving faster, but because this game has, has pretty challenging platforming along the way, very difficult stages to navigate, and... Uh, so the ability to run really fast also allows you to jump between platforms and avoid having to land potentially on spikes or, or lose progress or something like that. Uh, there's a Force Saber Blast, um, which is an ability for your lightsaber to act additionally as a blaster. So every time you swing your lightsaber, it shoots a blaster beam. I, I don't know what to make of that, but um, it's in the game, so uh, use that knowledge uh, sparingly. Uh, force Crush is an ability that allows you to clear the entire screen. So this is th these Force abilities are all in order of how much they cost to use. So Force Speed is obviously the cheapest one to use, and as we go along the list, it becomes more and more expensive to use these Force abilities, almost as if you're casting spells. Um, there's a Force Levitate, which allows you to fly temporarily by holding the A button. It's not particularly fast, but you can use it to maybe skip some platforming. If you're finding some of the levels very challenging platforming-wise, you can activate it and just fly up to a higher platform, for instance. And then lastly, there's a Force Warp ability, which just takes you to a random location in the stage. Each stage has pre-programmed positions where you could potentially warp to. There's no guarantee that warps are going to take you forward. They could, in fact, take you backward if you start using them midway through the stage and so this comes with some of its own challenges um the force warp actually plays a significant role in the speed run i'll mention it briefly at the end um but as you can imagine that does play a big part in the speed run in addition to this game being a platformer it also has a relatively straightforward space combat mission um so every time you go from level to level um, you fly to those levels, and before you're allowed to land on the planet that you're going to, you have to fight off a wave of TIE Fighters, uh, enemy TIE Fighters. And each time you go to a planet, it's more and more of them. So the first planet you go to, it's only five of them, then the next one's seven, then the next one nine, and, and on and on. Uh, it becomes more and more uh, difficult. You are still one-hit kill in this state. So if you get hit by a, a, a gunshot, by a blaster shot, from one of the other ships, um, you will die instantly. You get the ability to use uh, a shield, but you have a limited number of those. Or alternatively, um, if the shot is close to being off screen, you can just turn. And if the shot goes completely off screen before it lands, it doesn't hurt you. So there's some sort of maneuvering that you can do to avoid getting hit. It's pretty challenging if you're not uh if you don't have quick reflexes and can shoot the tie fighters down immediately um and in addition to that you really do have to play this very quick mental game of do i try to block the shot even though i've only got three um defense beams or defense shields or do i try to turn quickly enough to get it off screen and making that decision really quickly in the heat of the moment can be extremely challenging but you have to de defeat a number of them in order to get to land on the planet, so you're going to be doing this a lot. You're going to get used to it, perhaps. Uh, you're going to get more comfortable with it as time goes on, um, but it is quite a challenge. 
one of the big complaints that a lot of people have with this game is that aside from the title screen and the boss fights, which boss fights, uh, which by boss fights, I'm primarily referring to um, the battles against the enemy TIE fighters as you go to land on other planets. Aside from those, there's really just one song in the game. Um, this game was composed by Hiroyuki Kawada. Um, he was the composer for this game, and he had a, a number of other titles under his belt uh when he worked for Namco, uh, other games like Legend of Valkyrie um, for the arcade, Air Combat for the arcade, uh, Ace Driver, Tekken 3, Ridge Racer 3D. So there's a lot of games uh, he has under his belt. So let's take a quick moment and listen to a little bit of this music before we come back and talk more about this game. So you may actually be familiar with this game a little bit. This game uh, has an infamous reputation, and it's not just for its difficulty and for being somewhat bad and deviating from the Star Wars lore. But one of the game, one of the things about this game that I think a lot of people do remember uh, when they've heard about it at one time or another is this infamous setting where when you fight a boss, it always starts out as Darth Vader, but it sort of transforms into something else. So. Every time you fight Darth Vader um, in the game, aside from two instances, you're actually fighting Darth Vader's apprentices, and they're all changelings. I don't know exactly where this comes from in the Star Wars universe. I don't think that this is necessarily canon, and if it is, it had to have been sort of uh, retconned in order to be incorporated in. But uh, they're all changelings who pose as Darth Vader initially, but once you attack them for the first time, they shapeshift into these different creatures depending on the level. So, for instance, in the first level when you've entered the uh, the Sandwalker, um, you fight against a scorpion. So Darth Vader turns into a scorpion, which I think is the one that most people remember. That's the one that everyone... This is the one where Darth Vader turns into a scorpion. That just seems to be burned into people's minds. But depending on the level, he transforms into other things. So uh, there's one level where it, it's completely underwater, and so you fight Darth Vader, and then he turns into a shark. So that one's pretty cool. Uh, then there's one where you fight him as a flying dinosaur. Um, pretty much the same thing. I mean, a shark just swims around in the water, but a dinosaur flies around the room. I mean, it more or less, the way he moves around the room is going to be the same. And then in one of the levels, he turns into a wampa, uh, which is a creature that's not actually introduced until Empire Strikes Back. So, I, I mean... In reality, if you think about it, this this game feels a lot like a game that's designed by people who had Star Wars thoroughly described to them in terms of showing them box art on the front of the VHS, but never actually saw a single Star Wars movie. So they know that there's this character named Darth Vader, and they know he's a bad guy, but maybe he turns into a scorpion. Who knows? They're just sort of, you know, flying by the seat of their pants, seeing what they can come up with, and, and I for one, commend them for their hard work in turning this idea into a, a fully-fledged game. Two of the times that you actually fight Darth Vader, once on the Death Star and once, I think, on Yavin uh, near the end of the game, you're actually fighting the real Darth Vader. And one thing that I think is really interesting is that the second time you fight him, uh, he actually has the ability to shoot 
uh, blaster shots from the tip of his lightsaber. I'm pretty sure that comes from Star Wars. I, I haven't read all the books. There's a lot of uh, extended universe that I'm not familiar with, but uh, I'm certain it's in there somewhere. I'm certain at some point Darth Vader has shot a blaster out of his sword. Um, who who among you can say whether or not that's true? It, it's there. It's things like this that sort of make this game such a unique and strange experience. They very clearly had some insight into both Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, and and most of the game ends up being sort of a strange combination of the first two movies. Uh, difficult to understand what exactly they were going for. I mean, at this point, the movies had been out for quite a while. I mean, as of 1987. Both Star I mean, I mean, the original Star Wars movie had been out for 10 years. I don't know how long the second Star Wars movie, uh, Empire Strikes Back, I don't know how long that one had been out. But it's not like these were new, uh, it's not like this was new information. You know, they could have easily watched the movie and modeled it after it. Um, and in fact, the, the later NES Star Wars that was made by, um, I don't remember who made the, the other NES Star Wars game, but they, you know followed the franchise a lot better they followed the themes and the story as best as possible in terms of the ability to make a game and so it, it's very strange that this one seems to have made no effort to actually research the material they were basing a game on and, and perhaps explains why um later another star wars game came out you know this one was just sort of insufficient to uh satisfy the needs of the star wars fans out there this game's filled with a lot of cryptic gameplay. I mean, we talk about cryptic gameplay on this podcast a lot. Things like Castlevania 2, having that moment where you have to crouch on the edge of the lake for a few seconds and it makes something happen. We talk about that kind of stuff all the time, but this game has a lot of the same thing. You know, there's a, a, a scene on Hoth where you have to activate C3PO to convince a guard to let you progress. Um, and there's really nothing in the game to indicate that that's something that you're supposed to do, but you're just supposed to know that at some point in the stage you need to pause and activate C-3PO in order to make progress in the stage. There's a, another spot in one of the levels where you're supposed to summon a whale to carry you across an ocean to get to Echo Base, and there's no indication that you're supposed to do this. And in fact, it, while, while it seems... Uh, necessary it's actually not if you have the force gems for it you could just like force levitate over the ocean there's no reason to wait on a cutscene to play um but in that case it would be a blind jump you would be just force levitating over a giant expanse having no idea that there's actually something on the other side and in fact the very last level of the game is the trench run uh when when luke skywalker is is going to destroy the death star and the way that this level is implemented is it's a top-down perspective with Luke in his uh, X-Wing. And he's flying around and you keep encountering these sort of forks where you can either go left or right. And there's no indication from the game which way is the right way, but one way will definitely kill you. You will run into a dead end and the other one will make slight progress in the level. And, you know, it's this kind of gameplay that becomes more frustrating than anything. If you imagine that you're playing this and you don't know the answers and you get to that spot in the game, you've only got one continue because you don't know about the code. You've only got three lives and you've played all the way through the game up to this point. So you probably don't have all three lives left. And every time you make a choice, you have a 50-50 shot, essentially, of losing a life. And so you have to just guess and test um you know keep track of what decisions you've made so that you can continue making the right decisions it may involve gaming over and having to get all the way back to that point in the game to try again to make a little bit more progress and i mean it's that kind of gameplay that i think a lot of players find frustrating and a little bit of a betrayal you know a little bit of a i shouldn't have to guess i shouldn't have to be punished for guessing wrong uh, in order to make progress, you know, worst case scenario, often you'll have something like, you know, two doors and one of them makes progress and one of them takes you back, but it doesn't kill you instantly. This is more like, you know, Super Mario Maker. If you're not familiar with the, the meta in Super Mario Maker, you know, people will design levels where you have to guess between four doors and three of them will just kill you instantly when you go through them. You know, that's a betrayal. That's a betrayal on the part of the level designer to communicate to the player how to play the game. And I think that that can be seen as very frustrating. 
I think what makes it a real shame is that this game has a lot of charm otherwise. It's a, a fairly attractive game to look at. Um, it's a fun game to play if you sort of take out some of the issues with hitboxes. The actual platforming can be fun, the exploration can be fun, um, fighting enemies could be fun if it weren't so difficult to perform combat. And and the levels are varied, you know, it's it, it might be a little bit strange to see that their interpretation of you know, for instance, one level looks a lot like um, looks a lot like Egypt. So it looks like you're going inside of a pyramid with with Egyptian markings on all the walls. So it's a little bit silly in that regard. But at the same time, a lot of the levels are designed in such ways to be kind of charming, um, albeit filled with death pits and spikes and frustrating enemies and annoying platforming. But charming nonetheless for that era of gaming and for someone who goes into this with the expectation of being able to enjoy a star wars experience i think it's hard to not walk away from it really disappointed feeling like you know there was so much potential and it was just ruined you know the the title screen has that music there's cutscenes throughout where you encounter for instance uh, r2d2 playing the playing the recording from princess leia you get all of these sort of iconic moments from the movie giving you the feeling that you're going to get to see and play something that's a lot of fun and at the end of the day it just becomes sort of a letdown i think that that's really disappointing in terms of a speedrun uh, so just starting off, the world record is 1651 by White Hat 94. White Hat, if you're not familiar with him, is a fantastic NES speedrunner who has done so many wonderful games. Uh, and often he will, you know, just like any of the rest of us, will will pick bad games just for the sheer novelty of them. And this has to be one of them. Uh, this was a game that didn't have really any speedrunning attention before he played around with it. Um, but he routed it and did some really good things with it. 1651's a really impressive time, especially considering that that incorporates some serious randomness when it comes to the force warps. So I talked a little bit about that before. Um, the force warps are completely random. There's really no way to manipulate the RNG to get favorable patterns or or favorable warps to good spots in the level um the the randomness that's involved with that is too detailed too intricate it's it's actually been studied the the rom has been studied and it it's basically a lost cause to manipulate them and so every speed run is basically get to one of these two levels either death star or yavin and spend a ton of force power uh to warp and hope that you get a good one in death star uh, in the Death Star, there's one specific location that you can potentially warp to that skips a ton of the level. And so uh, a perfect run of the game would get that warp, but it's almost too inconsistent, you know, among all the other places that you can warp to in the level to make it worth it. And at the cost of so much force power that you really only get one attempt at it when you get there. Likewise, Yavin has a number of somewhat favorable places that you can warp to, uh, but likewise, if you don't get a favorable warp, if you don't warp somewhere useful, um, you can lose time that's completely out of your control, and that can be really frustrating. In addition to that, as far as uh, speed tech goes, there's also the force speed um, uh, force power, which happens to be the least expensive force power you can buy. It only takes five force gems, which is nothing compared to some of the other ones. And so being able to use that repeatedly to make platforming easier um, in order to uh, do small sequence breaks, you know, skip bits of platforming that the game intends you to do, but you can just jump over things. Uh, that can make a huge difference, but otherwise this game doesn't actually have a lot of speed tech. If you look at the way some of the boss fights happen, for instance, um, for the fights against Darth Vader, you need to hit him in the back, and so the speed tech for that is, you know, you jump in front of him and swing your lightsaber, and while he's swinging his, he can't turn around, so you jump to the other side of him and hit him in the back. When he turns around, you jump back to the other side of him, and so you can pretty quickly just combo him um, and get and kill him, but um, in general, there's not a lot of speed tech to be had. It, it's mostly just really solid platforming, a few calculated death abuses, and hoping that the force warps just do the right thing for you, um, which is really what it comes down to. And that's that's Star Wars for the Famicom in a nutshell. You know, I wish that there were more to say about this. And, and because this game has the reputation of being a bad game and because it's about such a beloved franchise like Star Wars, I wish I could recommend, I wish I could say, you know, go and try this game. It has a bad reputation, but it's charming. And 
The problem is that it is charming, but not necessarily enough to make up for how bad the game is. So I can't really recommend it. If you really find the novelty of terrible games fun, um, you can, I, I, you know, check it out, you know, completely ignore me, go check it out. Um, there's translation patches for it. It was only ever released on the Famicom in Japan. So there's no English version of it, but you can find translation patches to make it more fun if you think so. Um, you know, what do I know? Go take a shot at it. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, and maybe you're going to have a great time playing it. Um, just don't say I didn't warn you if you find it really frustrating. That's going to mostly do it for me. Uh, I'm I'm Author Blues. You can find me on Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube as Author Blues. You can obviously, as always, uh, find my awesome podcast host, John Carls, as John Carls on both Twitter and Twitch. And you can find him as John Carls1 on YouTube. As always, I'd, I'd love to just give a shout out to our awesome producer who does such great work for us. You can find him at BMorgs TV on Twitter and Twitch. Uh, he's the reason why this podcast sounds as great as it does, and, and he puts so much work into this. If you want to find the Frame Savers at any other location, uh, you can check us out on www.theframesavers.com. That'll give you a link to our discord our twitter uh, other social media places you can find us we love getting reviews and feedback on our discord server we love getting reviews and feedback on our itunes account it really helps us appear higher in the listings um you know we have a patreon that if you feel like you want to support us we use that money wisely in order to um, continue to promote all of our awesome projects that we're working on we've got some great stuff coming down the pipeline uh this summer that we're really excited to share with you guys uh, and your support means the world to us in our ability to make all of that stuff happen um don't forget to check out the warp world podcast uh there are buddies over at podcast.warp.world they have a great podcast that covers uh general twitch topics general streaming topics gaming topics and and sometimes delve into the world of speedrunning they slum it down here uh with us in the speedrunning world so definitely check them out as well um that's that's basically all i've got for you uh check out star wars um on the ness probably don't check out Star Wars on the Famicom and stay tuned because next week we're going to be doing an awesome episode episode 71 on Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back for the NES the good ones with Toad 22484 who is a fantastic speedrunner and an awesome guy so make sure you check us out check out our Twitch account uh, twitch.tv slash the frame savers which is where we'll be broadcasting that episode uh, live um, by the time this pocket comes out, it will have already happened, but make sure you're following us there to know when all of those awesome episodes are happening. We record them live, we get your Q&A, we answer them right there in front of you, uh, where you can laugh at the silly answers we have, so make sure you check us out. Uh, and that's it for me. Peace. Peace.